Hi, Cold Warrior 78 here today. I've gotten a lot of questions recently uh, since people are paying a lot more attention to personal protection. Uh, something to the effect of why revolvers? Uh, why did uh, everybody not pick up on uh, semi automatics uh, when they first came out? Uh, are semi automatics better than revolvers? Are revolvers still relevant in today's world? Whole realm of questions kind of like that. Uh, for those of you who are familiar with, with firearms, um, the short answer is a, uh, a revolver, uh, this happens to be a 1970s vintage uh, 38 special police revolver uh, combat masterpiece. Um, they still work. They do the job they're designed to do. They do it very well. Um, and quite often, this is what you have hanging around because it was dad's gun, grandpa's gun, something like that. So that's a short answer. If you want the more in-depth answer as to how we got to where we are today, that's going to have to take a bit of a history lesson. So if you're not into history, shut this off now. Uh, this is going to be mostly history of handguns as it relates to uh, personal defense kind of things. Um, from, we're starting in the Civil War and come up to today. That being said, understand that I'm talking about covering something in the neighborhood of uh, 150 years or more of handgun technology and history development. Uh, so this is a very broad brush kind of stroke. All right, you're not going to get all the details you need to have. There are several excellent videos by people that studied uh, the subject uh, in, in great detail. Uh, if you want to study the Develop of any of the particular firearms we're going to talk today. There's a uh, channel called uh, In Range TV. Uh, there's also uh, a related channel called Forgotten Guns. Yeah, Forgotten Guns. Excellent, absolutely excellent on the development of the major weapons that we're going to talk about today. Uh, they are they are history, uh, uh, gun history kind of things. Uh, they they do some shooting on it as well. If you want to see uh, videos of somebody actually pulling a trigger uh, and comparing this caliber to that caliber and this, you know, semi-automatic to this revolver or whatever, there's a channel named Paul Harrell. The gentleman is absolutely excellent. Uh, I subscribe to him. You ought to as well if you're interested in firearms. Uh, so go use those guys as a reference if you want more detail. This is, again, a broad brush. <clears throat> 150 years trying to compress into a couple of minutes. So let's get started. Handguns uh, will start in the neighborhood of the American Civil War. The American Civil War was fought primarily, uh, the primary infantry weapon on both sides was a uh, muzzle loading 58 caliber rifle. Um, that was the standard that throughout the war. Cartridge weapons were developed, breech loaders and repeaters were developed during the war. Uh, none of them got the kind of attention they probably should have gotten. Um, so, black powder, muzzle loader. Stand by. Sorry, life on the homestead, things go on. <coughs> we're hatching out some, uh, those chicks have already been hatched, they're uh, going on three weeks old now, somebody's going to pick them up tomorrow. Uh, they were knocking the top off because they like to start to fly. At any rate, getting back to where we were going with this. Uh, we're going to start in the Civil, Civil War. Uh, muzzle loading rifles were the predominant firearm on the battlefield. Pistols, handguns on the other hand, had several different versions. Uh, the revolvers that were available, uh, see that one, that's a Remington style cap and ball pistol. Okay, revolving cylinder, six shots. Uh, this was very, very popular. This is the Colt uh, Army model. You can tell because it's got the smoothed out uh, barrel, 44 caliber. And then the uh, 1858 Navy and caliber 36. Uh, again, this is a Colt style. You can tell because it doesn't have a top strap on it. Okay, just a simple single action, pull it back goes bang, keep cocking it, it'll go bang. Single action. Now, 
those weapons <clears throat> developed the big beginning of the war, carried all throughout the war, and then through on westward expansion after that, <clears throat> were considered the standard of the day. Now that's loaded, each, in, each individual chamber is effectively a small muzzle loader. Uh, you pour the powder in, you put the ball in, and then you put the primer cap on the back side, but you've got six in the cylinder, so you can keep cocking it and firing it. And if there's a misfire, as was not uncommon with these kind of weapons, you just cocked it again and pulled the trigger again. And that reliability was seen as a great plus. The late 1800s was a time of very, very intense development of firearms because a lot of things were going on at the same time. Black powder, while it was a standard, was seen to be a problem. You couldn't do a lot of the things developers wanted to do, like self-loading weapons, what we would call a semi-automatic today, because the fouling of black powder just crudded up a bore in very, very short order. Um, so none of the, uh, what we would call self-loading or self-semi-automatic uh, designs that were already drawn out would work at all because of the crap that the black powder would put in there. Also, black powder and its primers were very, very corrosive. You had to take one of these, if you shoot these today, as I do, uh, you literally have to give them a bath in hot, soapy water. Hot, soapy water. Now, any, most people that grow up around firearms is like, well, you don't want to get them wet. These you do, because you've got to have hot, soapy water to clean the crud out of here to make it shoot again. And then it's problematic as to get it dry, get it oiled, get it back into service. So powder uh, propellant chemist guys were looking at a way to get around the problems of black powder. Uh, you had developed during the Civil War the earliest breech loading weapons uh, that were really functional using cartridges. All right, now cartridges as defined at the beginning of the Civil War was simply your lead ball powder wrapped up in paper. That's not the cartridge we're talking about. Metallic cartridges, which is what we use today, um, were developed, uh, the Henry rifle, uh, the uh, uh, two or three guys that used various kinds of metallic cartridges, sometimes with an external primer cap, sometimes with a primer in it. Cartridge case technology and design uh, was in its absolute infancy during the Civil War, but it grew dramatically in the next 30, 40 years. Uh, you went from these, uh, uh, the Henry repeating rifle, uh, is one of the best examples of is a 44 caliber rimfire cartridge because they couldn't figure out how to get the primer in. Uh, I'm going to reach over here and grab a couple other cartridges. Uh, this is a 45 Colt. Okay, that was developed during the black powder era. Uh, today it's loaded with, with uh, smokeless powder, but most of the cartridges uh, of the day uh, certainly would have been loaded with black powder and uh, in a, as modern cartridges it has a percussion cap what we call them a primer there in the middle all right so the technology to develop this um, we don't think much of it today but it was really dramatically improved over the things that had been out just a little bit earlier than this uh, and the technology continued to improve so you could have cases that were stronger, more reliable, wouldn't blow up on you. Uh, that was a severe problem. There was a thing called case head separation. Right in here is the, the case head. Uh, on 4570s, for example, early case head separation got so bad that the uh, uh, soldiers were supposed to be issued a tool that when the bottom part of their uh, cartridge ripped off of the other shank of the cartridge, and was stuck in the chamber that they could put this tool in there and yank it out. Most of them just used a Bowie knife or something to get in there. Problems. If your cartridges don't work, then regardless of the design of your weapon, nothing's going to work right. Okay, so cartridge case development uh, dramatically improved in the 30, 40 years immediately after the Civil War. Now this is a 38 Smith & Wesson. I'll put the 45 back up here for an example, and you can see how dramatically bigger 
the 45 is from the 38 Smith & Wesson. Uh, this was considered a self-defense round for hideaway guns in the late 1800s. It was a black, originally black powder loaded. Uh, it had a 148 grain round nose bullet on there. All right. Um, you can still find the small Smith & Wesson uh, revolvers, one, two, and three uh, break open tops that were designed to shoot this little thing. Uh, again, they were, they were bicycle guns. That was the name they were associated with because in the 1890s people were riding bicycles and they thought they had to have a defense against dogs. I would want to shoot this against a dog because quite frankly I don't know that it would really take a dog out. Uh, and I don't think that was a very functional self-defense cartridge. But anyway, it was popular. Uh, and you had everything in between. There were 38s and, th and uh, 44s, for the 4440, for example, uh, Smith & Wesson. 4440 was their standard. Uh, Winchester chambered their rifles for it. The 45 Colts we talked about. In the black powder era, if you needed more power, you went bigger. Okay? If the if the 38 Smith & Wesson wasn't big enough, wasn't powerful enough, then you either went to one of the longer versions. There was a what they called the Long Colt, uh, which was a longer version of the 38 Black Powder again. That's the one that got the Army in trouble in the Philippines. We'll talk about that in a minute. Or you went higher caliber, so you went from a 38 to a 44 or a 45. Uh, black Powder pistols were limited in velocity. 600, 800 feet per second, uh, 900. You could load some of these cap and ball pistols to, uh, to 9, 950 if you really crammed the powder in there, but you were taking a chance on blowing yourself up if you didn't have a quality uh, cylinder. And not all of them, frankly, were. Metallurgy is the next step I want to talk about. So your cartridge case design has to improve in order for the self-loading uh, firearms designs to work. You got to have something other than black powder because it just cruds things up too much for self-loading things to work. The, the next thing is metallurgy. You've got to have a, uh, a barrel, a frame. The, the whole system needs to be strong enough um, and durable enough to take higher pressures, higher the, drive higher velocities, uh, and the if you're going to have a semi-automatic, a self-loading kind of thing, things are slamming back and forth and cranking and whatever, uh, iron is not strong enough. And most of the guns, even though the use of the term steel, uh, by the modern definition, weren't steel, they were iron. And uh, iron frames, iron barrels were just not strong enough for what was coming. So, you've got metallurgy, of the gun, of the, the, the steel itself, got to get stronger. Cartridge case technology's got to get better. And then the chemistry involved in making a propellant has got to change. And all three things are being worked on independently by people around the world. Uh, and typically in parallel. Uh, so what you wound up with is by the 1880s, uh, from, from 1884 to 1889, a dozen different patents were issued around the world, uh, French, Russian, a couple in America, a couple in England, uh, to chemists and, and developers who were trying to come up with a smokeless powder uh, improvement to black powder. Different versions of that, but bottom line is by 1889, uh, what the British called cordite uh, was adopted for their rifles. Uh, it was a smokeless powder, nitrocellulose-based uh, cartridge. Again, by, the, by that point, the cartridge case technology got so good that the British developed their 303. Um, the 303 British was, was used all the way up through two world wars uh, and into Korea. So what you had was, if you remember when I talked about infantry rifles in the uh, Civil War, 58 caliber muzzle loaders. Most of the world went from 58 caliber ish muzzle loaders to something in the neighborhood of 45. We went to a 4570 in the Trapdoor Springfield. The Brits went to the uh, 455 uh, in the Martini, Martini Henry. Uh, 
well, once the smokeless powder came out, you get more velocity with a smaller projectile. So now the 303, 3040 Krag, eventually 30-06. The uh, Germans had 7mm and 8mm Mausers, all based on this new propellant, which had a much higher pressure in the chamber that required the new steel. All right, see how these things all work together? If you have a higher pressure and you don't have the metallurgy to work it, everything blows up. And in fact, many of this style of gun was blown up by people making conversions for cartridges uh, and shooting a, a hotter smokeless powder cartridge at them and literally blowing the steel up. Um, and in fact, that was a very popular thing. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. So, uh, 1880s, 1890s, now you're getting into the original era of smokeless powder. Now all of these concepts that have been hanging around for d almost a decade or more um, on self-loading and all kinds of other actions of weapons. Excuse me, chickens in the background, they're just being stupid. Because that's kind of what chickens are. Hey, hush! Yeah, I like that help. Chickens have got to be the dumbest animals on God's green earth, but that's a subject for another video. So as I said, the three things that you, you needed in order to get to the modern firearms is the improved metallurgy, the improved cartridge case technology, and the improved powder so that you no longer have the fouling. So between uh, the late 1880s and let's say the beginning of World War I, pretty much every design of, of semi-automatic, uh, any operating system that you see today had been developed. Uh, and I know that's a bold claim, but if you really look at it, uh, everything that could be tried to make a weapon, a rifle, pistol, machine guns, uh, work on their own uh, was tried. You had uh, the gas-operated systems that you see today with a piston that, that hits an operating rod. You had the, uh, uh, if you're familiar with the Colt potato digger machine gun, uh, it had a gas port on the bottom of the barrel that literally hit a lever, knocked it down, and then that reciprocating action ran an operating rod and this thing would slam back and forth. And they used to call it a potato digger because if you got too close to the ground, it would dig a hole. <clears throat> well, that was tried in pistols as well. You had blowback, which is simply the barrel and a slide and a spring. And when you pull the trigger, the only thing that's containing that explosion, if you will, containing the propellant, is the weight of the slide and the strength of the spring. Uh, found very quickly that that didn't work with strong cartridges at all, but it's still used today in 22s, 30, uh, uh, even as far up as like a 380. Uh, these little pocket pistols, uh, 32s, 25s, uh, typically are straight blowback. If you see a pistol where the barrel doesn't move when you pull it back, that's a straight blowback, prob probably. There were also sort, all sorts of turning mechanisms and other things going on. Uh, but the, the two uh, that I'm going to talk about right now that became representative of <clears throat> what firearms went to, you know, into the First World War with, uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is the iconic Luger. All right. Uh, everybody loves the, the, the design of the Luger. I think it's really cool, <clears throat> and in fact it is. It's a great, great design. It was adopted by Germany in 1908. This toggle here on the top is what gets everybody's attention. It's actually a very solid system. Uh, it got a lot of crap in the press for being uh, less than reliable in the trenches in, in uh, World War I. Frankly, a lot of things were less than reliable in the trenches in World War I, including all of our rifles, all the enemy's rifles. Uh, so to give this crap about it, it really didn't deserve it. It's a very fine pistol. It is mechanically very complicated to make, which is a, a kind of a standard for the mechanical excellence of the turn of the century. Um, it was, like I said, it was adopted as a P08. Uh, in 1908 by the German army. It had already been marketed to the Swiss earlier than that, and uh, the Swiss developed a cartridge that they very much liked, 
or the original cartridge, which is out there. That is a 30 caliber Luger cartridge. It's a bottleneck, uh, round nose, full metal jacket in its original form. I can see it a little bit better that way. All right, bottleneck pistol cartridge. So the people that say that the uh, Sig 357 was the first bottleneck pistol cartridge, not even close. <clears throat> 1902 is when that came out because that's the round around which George Luger developed his pistol and it was only the German army that decided they wanted the 9mm they wanted something with uh, a little bit more hit uh, <clears throat> this was by the way an excellent cartridge because it came out of the barrel very very fast for the day over a thousand feet per second um, the, uh, the 9mm Parabellum didn't get anywhere near that and if you put one of these uh, out of the longer barreled versions of the Luger, uh, then you were hitting 12, 1400 feet per second in some cases. Uh, literally a, a small carbine. But again, back to pistols. So you had uh, uh, the, the Germans and many of the Europeans had Lugers and a whole array of other uh, style of semi-automatic handguns. The other major design is exemplified by the United States Army 45 caliber 1911 1911 obviously developed before that adopted in 1911 in this form this is uh, a World War one version as a matter of fact uh, it's got the straight back strap <clears throat> this weapon um, in, in slightly modified form uh, is still available today. Uh, you can go out today and buy a 1911 style semi-automatic uh, gun for concealed carry. You know, they cut about an inch or so off the barrel, but it's effectively the same mechanism. They uh, worked a little bit on the inside and uh, developed the design. But uh, the basic design was there uh, actually, based on uh, Browning's design from, from 1900 1905, and it went through a very uh, interesting developing process. So you have in, in Browning's design here uh, what's called a tilting barrel. It's a locked breech. All right. Anytime the, the barrel goes up and down, either on a toggle or just on a little ramp, uh, that's the uh, uh, the Browning design. That that was around literally the turn of the century. Uh, so the major styles of, uh, of semi-automatic handguns and revolvers were around. Uh, let me show you another design. Now this again is the uh, 1970s version of the Smith and Wesson. Police 38, okay, double action. Everybody's seen these things. Now let me get this a little bit closer to show you a really cool what was a selling point on this. Now, you can see right here, the hammer has the firing pin attached directly to it. Now, when I pull the trigger, I'm uh, sure you can see that through there, but the firing pin protrudes through the frame and hits the primer. When you let go, watch the hammer, the hammer resets. That was a major safety addition that Smith & Wesson brought out in their M&P line of pistols in 1900. So the beginning, the very beginning of the 20th century, this action as it sits with Certainly there's been a few minor modifications since then, but the basic action of this is the same as an M&P pistol from 1900. Now that's going to be important for a minute, uh, for a reason I'll get into in a minute. So you had very reliable semi-automatic handguns that militaries, some militaries, uh, adopted, and you had very reliable uh, revolvers. Now let's get into why the revolver since there were already semi-automatics around. And for that we're going to have to go take a, a half step back. Particularly in America, uh, the 
the Western expansion, uh, black powder era, 4440 and 45 Colt. Uh, you had single action pistols. Uh, think you know standard cowboy guns, uh, cavalry guns. Then we got into uh, as, as that was going on in the West, particularly in the 1880s, 1890s. Uh, remember the little Smith and Wesson 38? Well, the civilized parts of the country thought that these 45s and 44s were just much too powerful. Uh, so various 38s uh, hit the market and were adopted by various police departments. Uh, the, the 38 Smith and Wesson being one of them, although I personally would, I would never carry that. Uh, but the uh, 38 Colt, both short and long versions. Uh, the 38 Colt was adopted by the United States Army in a double action Colt, uh, similar to this. Uh, just before we went to the Philippines, fought the Moros and found out that uh, it didn't penetrate their shields and when they were hopped up on some sort of uh, chemicals, it didn't stop them either. That's the reason the Army went back to a 45 caliber just in time to go to World War I. But this concept that a 38 is good enough for the, for the civilized parts of the country uh, became a big deal and 38 caliber uh, became more or less a standard police caliber uh, across the United States and many other parts of the world. Now, that brings us to the 38 Special. 38 Special is this one here. It's longer than the 38 Smith & Wesson. It's longer than the 38 Long Colt. Uh, originally loaded, even though it came out right at the beginning of this smokeless powder era, was originally loaded for the United States Army in black powder to give it more velocity to push the bullet a little bit faster. Uh, it was very quickly changed over for the civilian market to smokeless powder uh, and became the standard police cartridge for most of the 20th century, literally up through the mid 80s, mid 1980s, people, the officers are still carrying this. Uh, the original cartridge was loaded with 158 grain round nose lead bullet, like that one. Uh, this one is a more modern hollow point. Uh, we still use them today. Uh, I trained my son with uh, this thir this 38, as a matter of fact, and uh, this is the self-defense ammunition that we put in it. Now, with 158 grain bullet going at about, I, I wrote this down so I wouldn't mess it up, so excuse the reference to the notes. Uh, 158 grain bullet going between 850 and 900 feet per second, depending on the loading, you're going to get somewhere between uh, 250 and 265 foot-pounds of energy using the American system. Uh, not a terribly powerful cartridge by today's standards, uh, but it was acceptable. It was easy to shoot, it was light recoiling, uh, easy to train people to use this cartridge, and because of the safety Again, we're going to start talking about perceptions now. The perceived safety of this weapon, this design, uh, because until you pull the trigger, that hammer cannot go forward. There's a part in the mechanism that locks that hammer back. Uh, police positive was a Colt's version of it, same basic design. Um, so the safety was, was pushed really hard by the revolver people. One of the issues with early semi-automatics, uh, and I'll use the 1911 as an example, the original 1911, because of the ammunition at the time, the firing pin, when the hammer goes down, when you drop the hammer, the firing pin is literally extends from the front of the hammer to the face of the breech. Some of the earlier ones actually stuck out a little bit. Uh, and the idea was that the primers on some of this early ammunition were really kind of iffy. And so you wanted to slam that primer as hard as you could to make sure it was going to go off. Consequently, you have direct force from the hammer through the firing pin to crush that primer and then cycle the action. Now that led to a couple of problems. If you have a live round in the chamber, and the hammer is down, 
that firing pin is literally resting on the primer or just a hair behind it, a strong wrap on the hammer can set that round off. Now the Army didn't worry about that because their answer was carry it with an empty chamber so that every time you pick the gun up, you rack the slide, you're ready to go. Their standard up until I left the Army in 1992 was carry it with an empty chamber. Now technology had long since passed them on the civilian market. They changed the firing pin, they shortened it, they put a bigger spring, a heavier spring on it. Uh, even to the point where some of the custom guns had titanium firing pins so that when the hammer was down on the frame, no amount of force was going to make that firing pin hit hard enough on the primer to make a gun go off. So the 1911s that you buy today are completely safe to carry with a round in the chamber and the hammer down. Also, uh, a lot of people carry this in what's called condition one cocked and locked. You have the, turn around this way so you can see it, you have the safety on, manual safety, and there's a grip safety. So in order to make this gun fire, you have to hold it properly to depress the grip safety. You have to depress the manual safety, then you pull the trigger, gun goes bang. It's a three-step process. Uh, many people who carry the 1911 today for self-defense carry it in what's called condition one, which is cocked and locked. Again, with modern firearms, completely safe. They have developed this design over the intervening 110 years, uh, 100 and what, nine, I guess, to, to the day, uh, that they've made it a little bit safer, okay? The Army never authorized carrying it cocked and locked, and you would get in a lot of trouble uh, in my day if you were caught with a cocked and locked 45. But that safety issue of not being able to carry it with a round in the chamber uh, was seen as an issue. Now, using this as an example of many of the European designs, although Europeans also had straight blowback and, and the various other styles, uh, this was also not designed to carry a round in the chamber because when you cock it, all right, it's a striker fired pistol, but it's a single action striker. All right, so it's got a very light trigger pull. It's a wonderfully accurate weapon, but it was also not designed to be carried with a round in the chamber. So when you drew this out, you'd cock it and then go about your business. All right, semi-automatics of the earliest day were not designed to carry around in the chamber for the most part. Smaller pocket pistols had safeties and various things on it <clears throat> that were, but the military adopted weapons were not designed for around in the chamber. And Smith and Wesson particularly, uh, and I believe Colt as well, although I haven't seen anything about that, jumped on that bandwagon uh, with the police market uh, in the early 1900s uh, to the point where I've been told, I haven't, I've not seen this myself, my dad told me that a uh, one of the departments, uh, police departments in the East Coast, uh, maybe Cleveland, Ohio, or Albany, or somewhere, literally took a loaded Army 1911, round in the chamber, hammered down, and smacked this with a mallet and the gun went off and this was on an early newsreel or some sort of advertisement and it was all over the gun media and uh, uh, the, you know the magazines and newspapers of the day that uh, if you wanted to carry a safe handgun this was the gun to carry and uh, and they used that kind of uh, advertising up through the 1960s I can remember uh, asking police officers when I was younger, why do you carry a 38 instead of a 45? Uh, and the answer was safety. This is just much more safe to carry. It's not going to drop and go bang. I certainly don't want that to happen. So safety was the issue why these things were so popular. Uh, also, like I said, the 38 caliber bullet and cartridge was fairly well developed for the time. Uh, they solved the case head separation problem, 
so the cartridge case itself was very very reliable the bullet 158 grain lead soft nose eh, was adequate ish um, over the history of the gun uh, up through the 1950s 1960s 1970s uh, the perception was we need more power well you get more power by getting to a bigger cartridge. Uh, that was recognized in the 1930s with the development of the 357 Magnum, which is simply this cartridge, an extra eighth of an inch long, loaded with hotter propellant charge and the same bullet. Uh, and they made it a little bit longer so that you could not chamber the 357 into a 38 because the 38 being a, a, an earlier gun was designed at about 17,000 pounds or so chamber pressure. All right, and that 17,000 pounds again pushed the bullet out the barrel something in the neighborhood of 850 to 900 feet per second. Um, steel's gotten better, so these things are safer and designed to a slightly higher pressure today, but when the 357 came out in the 30s, 5,000 PSI in their chambers. So again, steel had to get better. It's obviously thicker. That's why a 357 is going to be heavier than a 38. Um, but you put a 357 into a, a 38 chamber, if you can, and you have to ream it out to do this. You can't just drop it in. Uh, you're going to blow that sucker up because you're working it at literally twice the pressure plus some. Okay, but higher pressure gives you higher velocity. And they recognize that way back. So where the 38s uh, were seen to be lacking. The 357 came out. By the 1970s, uh, you had policemen carrying 38s, 357s, uh, 44 Magnums, 41 Magnums. Uh, those were seen as highway patrol guns, uh, border patrol guns. Uh, there were a couple of very famous sheriff's deputies and border patrolmen carried 357s and those kind of Magnums, uh, often with a six inch barrel on it to maximize that velocity. But it was all based on this reliability. It always fired, and if you had a lousy round for whatever reason, uh, and frankly, if you were carrying, let's say, reloaded ammunition instead of factory ammunition, uh, why you would do that and bet your life on it, I don't know, but I know people who did. Uh, it was a very simple matter of pull the trigger, it clicked, pull the trigger again, next round's going to go bang, more likely than not. Um, and so that reliability and the safety attached to this uh, kept these things in service during a time period when semi-automatics were available everywhere. Uh, you had pocket semi-automatics for self-defense, the Colt, for example, 1900, 1904s. Uh, General Patton carried one. Uh, you, if you look at the movie Patton that came out in the, in the uh, 1970s, there's a scene where he puts one in his... Uh, back of his uh, belt. He actually had a inside the waistband holster that he carried in there. And the, uh, by the way, the two pistols that he carried, his ivory handled uh, Colt single action armies were 357. They were not 45 Colt. Uh, he, he wanted the most powerful handgun cartridge in the world and he got it in a match set. So there you have one of the most famous generals in history carrying a very old style revolver into battle. Um, perceptions again. So what was it that finally knocked the 38 and the revolvers out of uh, their preeminence? Uh, and it comes down to the bullet again, the bullet that's actually in the end of the cartridge. Uh, the smokeless powder versions of the 45, you have a flat nose round bullet, the 38 Smith & Wesson, 158 grain round nose lead bullet. During the 70s, and probably starting in the 60s, these hollow points were starting to be played with. Now, hollow point expansion was not reliable through the 70s and 80s. And it was only until gold dots, the original gold dots, and the original uh, hydroshocks came out that you had a reliable uh, 
hollow points available for somebody that wanted to carry a semi-automatic. Prior to that, all you had was what we call ball ammunition, a round nose, full metal jacketed uh, slug, for lack of a better term, really good on penetration, uh, nine millimeter at a thousand or eleven hundred feet per second, uh, the 45 automatic cold pistol ACP, uh, again depending on your barrel length, uh, stepping out somewhere around 900 feet per second. Um, Excellent penetration, but not good for creating a wound cavity that would immediately stop somebody in their tracks. Typically, they would uh, go all the way through the target and endanger somebody behind them, which is one of the reasons why police departments didn't like that. If you're constrained to shooting a full metal jacketed bullet, then this is not as good a police weapon as it should be because that bullet's going to go through your intended target and might hit somebody else might ricochet off a building. The, uh, the lead bullet coming out of a 38 is likely to stop inside that target or if it does get outside that target it's not going very far because it's already deformed. So in the 70s you had a perception that these uh, 38 special wasn't strong enough therefore the 357 Therefore, let's get into expanding bullets. The, uh, the hollow points and soft point bullet technology had been in the hunting industry for decades. Uh, and it was realized that uh, the, the term, we have to stop the threat, uh, you hear that all the time nowadays in concealed carry classes, that came out in the 70s because policemen were firing their weapons and not stopping their attacker. Uh, so. Uh, a wide range of, of companies started working with hollow points. Most of the early ones were absolute crap. They didn't work. Uh, a company called Supervel in the 70s actually had the first couple of uh, hollow point cartridges, uh, bullets, that actually expanded within the range of velocity uh, that was available to the 38 Special. Uh, another way that they were trying to push up the power of 38 Special was something called Plus P. And you hear that nowadays as well with 9mm plus P and plus P plus. And all that is simply doing is taking the cartridge uh, that is designed for, uh, say, 17,000 pounds per square inch, uh, and most of the loadings are not going to go right to that limit. They're going to be pushing maybe 15,000 PSI. So you've got a range of where the uh, velocities are going to be. Well, if you load that all the way to the top, but don't go past it, uh, that's where the plus P came in. That was designed for, uh, particularly for the 38, so that you could get the absolute maximum velocity out of that cartridge. So the plus P's were designated, uh, like I said, originally for the 38, so the more velocity, now you can get into a pl place where those hollow points start to expand reliably. So let's step back again. We're talking about hollow points. Why didn't they work in a semi-automatic? Well, it goes back to design for hard-nosed, metal-clad, full metal jacket, whatever you want to call it, uh, round-nosed bullets. If you change the geometry of the bullet, then you need to change the geometry of the feed ramp on the inside <clears throat> so that it will feed properly. All right, so I've disassembled the 1911. I've got the barrel holding it here in my finger in the position it would be in approximately when it's in battery. You can see around right here in the magazine. All right, now the feed ramp is partly in the frame in this case and partly on the barrel. You see those little shiny parts there? As the slide comes forward it has to hit this round and the round gets fed up into the barrel right there all right that's a rather steep angle you see it from the side you can see how much of a jump it really has to make now stand by
All right, so we're back again. So the geometry of getting the round from the magazine up into the chamber uh, is a design characteristic unique to any given pistol. And it's based on the round that the designer is, is using. Full metal jacketed round nose bullets for semi-automatic pistols were a standard through the 1980s because that's all that would feed reliably. The early hollow points, and I'll use this as an example, had a lot of lead around the edge of it. So when that hit the feed ramp, it would jam, or it would go up at too high an angle and it would jam, or it would jam right into the frame and it wouldn't go anywhere. The lead hung up on the feed ramps, making the guns unreliable. You don't want an unreliable gun if you're going into a gunfight. So it took both a slight weapons redesign, uh, first off the perception, again perception, that there is a need to redesign the weapon, and then why do you redesign it, how do you redesign it, so that it functions reliably with the, uh, the available ammunition, uh, the, the ammunition that your customers now want to shoot and carry. And that took a lot of years. The military never changed the design. If you take uh, modern self-defense ammunition and try to fire it out of a military 1911, you're probably going to experience a lot of jams. And you're going to wonder, why did anybody ever de design this pistol so badly that it doesn't fire the ammunition? And that's because the feed ramp is designed with a full metal jacket in mind. Now, that's not just a hit on the 1911. All of the 9 millimeters, everything that was on the market uh, in the 1970s, 1980s, had that problem. And therefore, they all had to change. Um, uh, throating, barreling, uh, existing weapons was a big business for a lot of uh, uh, gun shops uh, and still is. Uh, there's a big business to do that. But you had to have reliable ammunition first and then they rebarreled or, or changed the geometry of the feed ramps second to make that work. And that didn't happen until the FBI. Uh, in the 1980s decided that they wanted to drop the revolver and go with a 9mm semi-automatic. And that drove the technology to change because, frankly, an FBI, uh, an order for pistols from the FBI is enough to make uh, profit for a gun company. <coughs> a couple of guys carrying here and there, not enough incentive to do anything. When the FBI said, we want to do this, then everybody said, oh yeah, there's a market for this because if the FBI does it, other police departments will do it, then individual carriers will do it, there's something here. Uh, and like I said, it wasn't until, uh, in, in my personal uh, experience, that uh, the gold dot from Spear and the uh, Federal Hydroshock, uh, the original one with a little post in the middle of it, uh, were a reliable enough that they would open within the velocity range that you had coming out of a service pistol, not some test pistol with a nine inch barrel, but an actual pistol that somebody was carrying. So the hollow point opened reliably, step one. Step two, it functioned at near 100 percent, 99.99 something percent in the, in the various tests in the handguns that the uh, uh, FBI was looking at. And that's what really sold not only the FBI, but now all of the police departments on going to that kind of round. That's when this thing or a nine millimeter version with a hollow point, what become now modern self-defense ammunition, now that makes a great deal of sense because now the ability to reload with a box magazine uh, and all those kinds of aspects really come into their own. That's why it took so long because the expanding bullets, the, the modern self-defense ammunition that we consider today as being ubiquitous. It's everywhere you can buy it. Anywhere you can buy ammo, you can buy this fancy self-defense ammunition. Not cheap, typically a dollar a round or more, but it's there and it's reliable. Almost any major brand 
is as reliable as almost any other major brand. I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, not so until the mid uh, mid 1980s, and that's when you saw everybody get off the revolvers, and then collateral to that, uh, you had a big push by Glock with their polymer pistols, uh, and boom, now we're off to the races. Between the mid 80s and today, you've got uh, this plethora of uh, semi-automatic handguns on the market, uh, from big ones to little tiny ones, uh, in all kinds of calibers, all capable of shooting self-defense ammunition. So you have expanding bullets that will do much, much more damage on target than your standard uh, hollow point, or excuse me, uh, hardball will. So long way around saying that's how we got to where we are today, where semi-automatics make a very good deal of sense from a self-defense standpoint, uh, because you have a reliable bullet that will expand. You have uh, reliable weapons that will fire, chamber and fire those rounds all the time. Now, caveat on that. Every gun, every gun has its own individual caliber preference, okay? Uh, brand preference, I should say. Um, for example, in my carry gun, the original gold dots, the original hydroshocks shoot exactly at point of aim. They function absolutely 100% every time. I love them. Other brands shoot a little to the left, a little to the right, a little high. Uh, some of the ones that I've gotten don't function reliably. They, they jam. The feed ramp, even on my new gun, doesn't take all kinds of ammunition. It takes most of them, but some of them it just flat doesn't like. Uh, there's a frangible kind of ammunition. Uh, I'm not going to mention the brand, but uh, I usually carry it around here on the homestead because if I have to shoot at a dog that's chasing my chickens, I don't want a chance that um, the round's going to hit a rock, you know, and ricochet off and do damage. So a frangible is going to hit the rock and <laughs> just stay right there. So I like the idea of frangible ammunition, but that particular brand while it shoots well when it shoots, um, often causes jams on, on loading. So it's not a, a very reliable round to carry. Uh, so that being said, any pistol, handgun, whether it's a semi-automatic or a revolver, you need to practice not only with your practice ammo, but you need to take a couple of rounds of that very expensive self-defense ammunition and see where does it shoot in relation to your sights because often the sights on a, on a handgun are not adjustable particularly well. Uh, these, I mean, this original one, you can take a look at those. Those are abysmal, absolutely abysmal. Sights are a big deal that, that have improved uh, in the last... Uh, nine years but you have to test your gun with your ammunition and make sure you know where it shoots and that it's reliable in your gun I don't care if you love Hornady I don't care if you love Federal or Remington or whatever uh, shoot it in your gun and make sure it functions reliably and it patterns shoots where you are aiming um, because if it doesn't do those two things it's not the right ammunition for your gun now, semi-automatics are now very, very viable. They're everywhere. Everybody makes them. Why are revolvers even considered? Why does anybody even make these things anymore? They're dinosaurs. Well, they're still viable for the reason I said in the beginning. They still work. They still do the job they were intended to do. They're absolutely safe. Uh, they are a little bit ammo restricted from the standpoint of a service revolver has typically six rounds. Your little hideaway guns typically have five. Um, there are some exceptions to that, but uh, again, the perception that this is simpler than the semi-automatic, and arguably it is, um, most people who buy handguns for self-defense are not gun guys, are not going to go out and put thousands of rounds through them. 
whether or not they ought to, they don't. Most people who buy handguns don't put enough rounds through them to even get through the break-in period. Uh, if you read most manuals, there's a two, three hundred round break-in period, even with revolvers, uh, before they recommend you carry them in earnest for self-defense. So if you don't shoot a lot, you don't know the kinds of issues that could come up. Semi-automatics have a number of different jams, uh, failure to feed, stove pipes, things like that. You need to know how to handle when it comes up. With something like this, like I said before, you pull the trigger, if it doesn't go bang, you pull the trigger again. It's that simple. Now, loading it, reloading it in a combat situation, certainly there are some issues attached to that. There are reloaders and speed loaders and things that help uh, with that situation, but the bottom line is, unless you're in a situation where you're going to fire routinely more than six rounds, how big a problem is that? Uh, and here's where we get to the the lack of really good information: uh, civilian self-defense shootings. Uh, not, I mean, you would can you would think that there is a wealth of data out there available to mine. There is not. I don't know why police departments don't keep that kind of information, but they don't, bottom line. Uh, two elements in a study of firearms instructors for the police academies, uh, a study that was done by this uh, national firearms instructor uh, aimed at trainers in police academies to train policemen, uh, the studies that he found, the only and I believe it was uh, one study in New York City and one study in, uh, I believe it was Los Angeles Sheriff's Department. Um, the, the average number of rounds fired in a, in a police engagement uh, when they were carrying revolvers was like 2.3, 2.6, something in that neighborhood. Uh, and now that they've gone to semi-automatic 9 millimeters, it's 3.6 or 3.7. So typically even with policemen with high magazines, high count magazines, uh, you're not shooting more than three, four rounds. Generally, obviously there are times when it happens, but let's face it, don't plan your life on what the movies do, okay? You're not going to go into, if you're the average concealed carry holder, uh, personal, def personal defense kind of situation, you're not going to go in a situation where you're going to have 90 guys attacking you. It's not like the movies uh, make it out to be Hollywood wouldn't know a, a, a real gun battle from their hole in it. Anyway, <clears throat> I digress. So a revolver that carries five or six rounds, certainly six rounds, is going to be within the capability of firing enough rounds to end the gunfight. Most of the time, 90% of the time, I don't know. I, there's not enough data to, to give a number on that. I feel comfortable enough that uh, this is the gun I trained my son to carry until he gets around to buying his own. He's going to carry a 38 caliber 4 inch revolver. Everybody on property at the moment is armed uh, and most of them are carrying 38s uh, simply because it's the easiest thing to train them on. And training is a big deal. 38 Special is a fairly inexpensive round. You can shoot a lot of it. 9mm is certainly an inexpensive round. You can shoot a lot of that, too. Uh, as it turns out, I'm a dinosaur. I had a bunch of these, so I still have them. 4-inch, 6-inch, snub nose. Uh, they still work. So that's why these are still made today. That's why they're still functional today. That's why people still carry them today, because they do the job they were intended to do. So that was a long way around, a very simple answer, but... Without the history and understanding how we got here, um, most people wouldn't accept the answer that, yeah, they still do the job they're intended to do. So uh, this is Cold Warrior 78 saying, hey, get back out in the woods. And if you're thinking about buying a uh, self-defense handgun, uh, take some time to really think about your personality. Are you going to be a gun guy enough to get out to the range and shoot it as often as you need to get the training that you need to that means signing up for class somewhere uh, even with this uh, illness running around us there there's still training 
to be had out there. <clears throat> are you going to take the training you need? Are you going to shoot the weapon often enough to know everything there is to know about it? Because if you're going to carry that thing to protect your life and the lives of your family, you need to be an expert in it. So that means practice. It means train. Well, first off, training. Then practice that training. Uh, and you shoot enough that you know everything there is to know about your particular gun. Okay? And if you don't think that you're going to do that, semi-automatic may not be the right answer for you. Maybe a revolver is. You'll have to decide on your own. Okay? So, Cold Warrior 78 saying, get back out in the woods and have a good time. Bye-bye.